Welcome back, everyone, to the Jake Bro Show. Joining us on the podcast today is Anna from Ukraine. Last time she was on the channel was actually August of 2022. That was a year and a half ago. Anna, it's great to have you back. How have you been? Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure and honor to be with you and with your beautiful community. And as I watch you on a regular basis, I don't have this feeling that a year and a half has passed since we last spoke on your channel. But uh, definitely, perhaps when I was speaking then back in August 2022, I thought that in February 2024, we will be already rebuilding Ukraine, living in a new peaceful reality. But many things changed since that time. And um, our desire to win did not change. Uh, my channel also grew together with the community, and I'm very grateful for your support uh, in this dimension too. Um, I think that uh, for Ukraine, uh, nothing changed greatly. I mean, the people are same resilient. Sometimes we do feel fatigue, but as many inside Ukraine repeat, I like this phrase, you cannot be tired at war because if you're tired, you're dead. So our choice is to remain optimistic, strong and protect our land. And I think lots of important values apart from the territory, but also globally. So I think back to the first winter of this war, going back mm, 13, 14 months, when Russia's primary strategy was going after Ukraine's energy grid, all these videos of rolling blackouts, Ukrainians without running water, without heat, without electricity. Thankfully, I believe this winter has been better as far as keeping the lights on in Ukraine's major cities. But how has this winter been for the Ukrainian people? Difficult, just as the previous one. They, they are different. And uh, we have to confess that Russia adapts quickly to this war. And uh, winter 2022-23 was about blackouts and it was really difficult. But at the same time, um, Ukrainians are resilient and they've learned really quickly how generators help solve the situation. And in a week or two, you could literally buy coffee on the dark streets and it was also a moment of unbelievable unity among people who would walk down those dark streets smiling to each other supporting each other uh, this year they did not attack our energy infrastructure that much uh, but they've attacked a different kind of infrastructure that is important for Ukrainian economy and also for uh, the war effort. Learning about various construction points, factories and plants. And this is also a problem. Plus, they continue destroying Ukrainian civilian infrastructure, which is a tragedy because it always results in lots of human victims and, of course, destroyed schools, universities, uh, cultural heritage or Objects and continues this feeling of terror on all the territory. And of course, they have become, I think that Russia has become more active in the diplomatic field, trying to shake other democracies to cause chaos worldwide and to try and persuade people to stop supporting Ukraine because you will fail or it's not your problem, you have other priorities. And unfortunately, using lots of things, starting from money and finishing with uh, fake narratives or some old stereotypes that still circulate in media since the Soviet times, they are successful in some dimensions. And our task is actually to debunk this myth and to demonstrate um, the real face of Russia for those who I believe see it or pretend not to see it, uh, something like that. So. Um, now they are trying to demoralize people, to demoralize our partners, and uh, we have to remain united. I think going back to last winter, Russia had more success knocking out Ukraine's energy infrastructure because Ukraine's air defense systems weren't as good. They've had a year to improve upon them. Not as many missiles are hitting their targets. So Russia decided to shift tactics. And I have to ask you, why do you think Russia, almost two years into this war, continues targeting civilians? They'll always publicly say, oh, we weren't targeting civilians. Ukraine must have shot down the missile and 
debris hits this apartment building or this neighborhood, which is nonsense. You can hear the drones uninterrupted hitting what they were supposed to hit. Why does Russia keep doing this? Why does Russia keep killing randomly civilians across Ukraine? Thank you so much for this very important question. And once again, using this opportunity, I would like to thank people all over the world who influence their decision makers. And Ukraine has a much better air defense system that we had at the beginning of this war. And I would like to stress that it is still very important to preserve and maintain this system because it saves literally thousands of lives, among them lots of lives of children. We can compare October 2022, for example, with uh, this year. It's a totally different thing. And first of all, we are super grateful for the ability to protect uh, our cities, our schools, our hospitals. Second, we are really proud uh, that uh, Ukrainian air defense systems, like, I mean, crew people who work there, uh, demonstrate really high results. And there were Lots of combined uh, missile drone attacks uh, that uh, Russians tested on Ukraine this year. And it's really difficult to work in such conditions when different types of missiles travel from different dimensions together with drones. And still, there were uh, days when we demonstrated 100% success or 99% success, which is huge because it's not only about accuracy, it's actually about real people and their life that can so this is a huge gratitude. And to those who doubt, look, this kind of support really saves human lives. And uh, why do they continue doing it? I know that many good people among my viewers and perhaps among your viewers are trying to find an explanation for this war that is logical, that is rational. Maybe it's money, as always, right? Or it's territories, but it's not limited to that, unfortunately. And Russia is very, modern Russia is very irrational in the decisions that it makes. That's why it makes it so difficult to predict its next step, for example. And for them, uh, the main task is actually to destroy Ukraine as a nation, as a culture, uh, erase our language, erase our traditions, and destroy us as people. So, uh, of course, they are very much interested in uh, Ukrainians escaping from Ukraine to other countries, saving themselves from war. So spreading panic is really good. And they actually do not care targeting a missile or a drone, whether they will get into the military object that they intend to, for example, or they don't. Because in both cases, they get the result they want. They spread this violence, they um, frighten people, and they kill Ukrainians, and they also make them leave their houses, uh, demoralize them. So this is the tactic that they uh, like. And uh, that's how they actually see the future, and that's what we also unfortunately see on the uh, territories that were or are still occupied. Lots of Ukrainian soldiers who visit newly deoccupied territories, they are frightened, with all, terrified with what they see. Uh, this uh, bodies of like people tortured, 100% uh, civilians, or sometimes elderly or children. Uh, this demonstrates another very important thing that people who want peace talks or other things have to understand that if active war stops, but Russia remains on these territories, or continues uh, spreading, uh, killings, murders, tortures of Ukrainians will continue. They just won't be that visible on the TV channel or elsewhere. But that's what they did in Kherson. That's what they continue doing in Luhansk, Donetsk region. They torture people, they execute people, people disappear. Uh, they change cultural identities of the regions by bringing lots of people to these territories. For me, it's extremely awful. I don't know, English is not my native language, whether I can use the word morbid like stories when you watch real estate agents working in Mariupol. 
Russian real estate agents who encourage people come and live in the flats where people were literally uh, killed or start to death or tortured. And they say like, you have to grab this chance right now because in a couple of years it will be more expensive. Or uh, Ukrainian relocated people who watch their flats being uh, sold and advertised this way. It's awful. And there are so many uh, things that shout that are super red flags, which demonstrate you cannot negotiate with Russia. You cannot forget what they've done already, and they will continue doing it if they are not stopped and not punished for, for this. I agree with everything you said, and I'll add, I think another reason why Russia continuously every day or every other day kills a couple of Ukrainian civilians is just to desensitize the violence of this war to Western audiences. I feel it when I check the news headlines every day and I see yet again, drone attack, three killed, 17 injured, whatever. And it's just every day, day after day. And it's hard to emotionally you know, care about each one of these events when these are people dying, they're human beings. But when it's a news headline and it just repeats, 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 you, you, you get numb and you, you tune out to what Russia is doing. Um, unfortunately, you are right. They just follow the rules of Stalin, who uh, is known to say that the death of one person is a tragedy and the death of millions is statistics. Is statistic. And at first, at the beginning of this war, it was very difficult for me as a Ukrainian to see how social media blurs the images uh, of uh, Ukrainian cities, for example, where a civilian is wounded or killed by a missile or anything like that happened. From one point of view, as a person, I understand this is the mechanism to protect people from seeing really difficult scenes of life. But for a Ukrainian, it is also traumatic because you're not able to share your like reality and to show what is happening because like, no, 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 that, that's too harsh. And uh, you are right, this is what happens like every day. There are stories that are heartbreaking, that are awful. After recent uh, attack on Kharkiv a day ago, a family, a mother and a father and three children, um, they burnt and the newborn child was like less than 10 months and uh, they are not able to extract his DNA from what was left. And this is like everyday reality in Ukraine, but I, I do feel that uh, there are so many stories that uh, people cannot process them. And um, another part of people protect themselves from such evil, and they, and that's how it all gets to the periphery of like news uh, thoughts, and that's what Russia needs. Let's now talk about uh, the changing tactics on the battlefield for Ukraine in 2024, and specifically all these attacks on oil depots and refineries. There have been strikes in the St. Petersburg area, in the Volgograd area, Krasnodar, uh, Rostov-on-Don. And it seems deliberate with the timing, given that we were more than halfway through this winter. M my question, and a lot of people were asking, is why wasn't Ukraine, if they had the capabilities, trying to shut down these depots and refineries the last two years? There were a couple strikes. I don't want to say it never happened, but... This seems to be the primary focus of Ukraine today. Get all of these depots and oil refineries offline, hurt Russia's export revenue. I just want to get your thoughts on this change in tactics from Ukraine and, and what you make of it. Well, uh, first of all, I think this is an important success of uh, Ukrainian. We can call it counteroffensive because who said that counteroffensive is just something that happens on the front lines? At the start of uh, Russian invasion to Ukraine, uh, when people believed, even those who loved and supported Ukraine, believed that the country will collapse in three days. No one could imagine Ukraine targeting Russian military objects and sometimes really deep inside Russian Ria, like St. Petersburg, uh, near St. Petersburg. 
and of course it is a strategy it's not accidental like shorts because uh it first of all um ruins the image of russia uh, and its partners economical influences and it also demonstrates to russian population that well not everything goes according to the plan or according it was said in your news but uh, for years, and actually uh, not only since the start of the full-scale invasion, but only even since 2014, when Russia with green people first annexed Crimea, one of the most repeated advice to Ukraine was do not escalate. Please do not escalate. I honestly think that it's a bad advice uh, because a victim, when protecting itself, cannot, like, escalate in this case and um, I do believe that our weak reaction to the annexation of Crimea and then Donetsk Luhansk regions was something that people like Putin did I cannot call him a person like <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> but uh, dictators like Putin they take as green lights okay nothing really bad happened to him after that and they they, they understand it as a possibility to continue that's why it's so important to finish this regime and this war in ukraine otherwise it will be also treated by other authoritarian regimes as green light to continue and uh, uh, i think that many of our partners asked ukraine not to do not to target objects. Uh, also, we did not have, like, we are working hard on the army of drones. There are lots of things that we invent, upgrade. We also learn, and I'm sure that back in 2022, without trainings and advice of our partners, too, we were not that, like, capable of doing it. And uh, thank you for asking this question, because here comes a very important conclusion that this Ukrainian special military operations on the territory of Russia actually demonstrate we don't have to be afraid of Russia. Many remember a Putin saying, like, if somebody uh, targets something on the territory of Russia, immediate nuclear answer, like, all the planet uh, will be destroyed. Um, they were uh, threatening and uh, many sane people believed. But here we see... Russia is often on fire, uh, there are lots of serious things destroyed there, and nothing happens because they are bullies, uh, and very often they have nothing to do but just like frighten, and for Ukraine it's vital to first destroy the military objects, and I'm really proud that in, the, in almost all cases we're capable to target uh, correctly, I mean like um, we um, do not copy this Russian tactics of like civilian victims. It's really difficult during the war uh, with big explosions because there is always someone who can walk by and you cannot like predict that. But in general, the choice of our targets is very legitimate. And once again, it must prove our partners that we are trustworthy. And uh, also... It is our task to bring war back to its homeland, to its motherland, to Russia, because that's the only way to stop it. And I, observing all of this big wars and conflicts, it is usually before the end that it returns back to the place from which it was born. And in our case, it's Russia. Unfortunately, I think uh, President Zelensky and the Ukrainian government knows this. But as far as the global energy supply, at least for the last two years, we needed Russia to stay online. When you think about the price of natural gas in Europe that first summer, this is the summer of 2022, it was at five or six X in three or four months because everyone was panicking about Nord Stream going offline. I do believe mm -hmm. in the beginning, the first year Ukraine was being considerate of what would energy prices be for Europeans or for Americans? And if you were blowing up oil refineries or sinking tankers, and that's what was causing prices in the West to go up, this might weaken support for Ukraine. So I don't, I don't think the timing is a coincidence that Ukraine waited until we were almost halfway through this winter to start going mm -hmm. after these oil depots and refineries to cause the least amount of disruption. But when we look at global energy prices, they're basically at two-year lows, and they're not spiking. 
So if we can gradually uh, weaken Russia's exports and, and there's not a traumatic shock to the global energy supply, uh, this is a win for Ukraine. But let's talk about inside Russia because a lot of things catch on fire. I see the pictures and videos and I, I have to laugh. I mean, you know, that, that wild berries warehouse fire, nobody died. That was a pretty big fire in St. Petersburg. Pretty, pretty spectacular to see. But as far as these utility disasters with uh, heating pipes blowing up and Russians being without running water, electricity, or heat, millions of Russians have been impacted by these utility disasters. I'm going to ask you the leading question, but why do you think this is happening in Russia? Because that is what Russia is. One thing that Russia is really good at is creating fake images, like the second strongest army in the world, or a really good like cultural life when it's not. And Russia is extremely fake. And those people who traveled like deep inside Russia, not Moscow and Saint Petersburg, which are the windscreens, but real Russia, they uh, saw the reality of uh, this country. And even uh, when we look at the behavior of Russian soldiers when they first saw Ukrainian, ordinary Ukrainian flats and started looting like sneakers, washing machines. Actually, it is already a tragedy of Russia, not only of Ukraine. And um, there were lots of things that demonstrate that even like Ukrainian uh, lifestyle, which is poorer to the US or some EU countries, we are still growing our strengths learning, uh, but it was something uh, unreachable for uh, an ordinary Russian. And uh, by the way, it's also a problem for the political situation because in Ukraine we always have active civil society and active civil society is typically made of middle class and in Ukraine we do have a lot of people who are a classical let's say European middle class with like two vacations one for Christmas one for summer they are able to travel abroad not often not that expensive but still they have the very same uh, hoodies and sneakers as you do, and they will not faint at the look of, I don't know, the US supermarket. And in many Russian cities, the poverty is really great. And uh, it is partially because of the government, which is an oligarch uh, organized criminal gang. And they always know that it's much easier to rule people who are angry, hungry. They do not think much about elections or things they dislike about their city council or something like that. So to some extent that's a strategy. Russia is also very big uh, and I believe in future it will dissolve naturally and people all over the world should not be afraid of that because at the moment it uh, includes 22 different national republics, some of which are the size of Argentina and all of them supply resources to Moscow and St. Petersburg and it was the same during the USSR times when for example, on Ukraine, in Ukrainian shops, you could not find chicken meat in the end of 80s, and it was in Moscow. Uh, so Moscow and St. Petersburg, they drink these resources from the regions that are not actually theirs. And it's very illustrative that in a country that is a top exporter of gas, there are lots of cities and regions that do not have gas. And when we talk about like toilets and no running water, it's the reality of Russia. So um, Russia is a poor country. And, you know, some I very rarely uh, get in conversations with super Russian trolls or supporters on the channel. But there is one question that none of them can answer. If Russia is such a good, such a strong country, why are no one like we, we do not see tendencies of people moving to Russia? of people dreaming to live there, uh, building their businesses. I'm not talking about some exotic cases of like creative people or something, but we do not observe people following this like Russian dream or something. So the reality, it is a very poor country where things like this lack of heat uh, or lack of gas are their realities. And it is just that today they are in the center of global attention because of their crimes that they commit on daily basis that we look more attentively. 
things like that were happening in Russia and will continue happening in Russia for uh, more years if we don't help them liberate, dissolve, I don't know, and uh, bring the resources back to uh, these regions, to these republics. Because at the moment they are in Putin's pockets, on the Moscow streets and elsewhere. And uh, sometimes I'm honestly surprised why these Miserable people who came to invade Ukraine do not turn back and liberate themselves in Kremlin with all of this, you know, like tanks and efforts. Why don't they walk in the direction of Crimea to solve the problems they have, like, inside their own country? This is a problem that uh, exists in every country. And the problem is nationalism, in that people want to feel superior simply because of, of, of where they were born. Uh, I argue if you want to feel superior to your neighbors or other countries in the world, you should have tangible region, reasons from things you've accomplished. But some people just want to say, I was born American, therefore I'm better than you know, people born in Mexico or people born in Canada. And for Russians, what do they have to be proud of? And it's, and it's their nationalism. They're just told, well, you were born Russian, you're just a superior kind of person. You should take pride from that. Never mind if you've done anything important with your life, you know. Uh, so I think for all these Russians dying in these trenches, why do they do it? And it's their identity. They don't want to destroy their identity. They're told you're brave, you're strong, you're, you're aggressive, you've got this great history because you were born Russian. Doesn't matter if you're barely literate and uh, HIV positive and you know, uh, your, your father was an abusive alcoholic to you when you were a child, like all these social problems that need to be addressed in Russia are not addressed. And what keeps them going is just their core identity that they've been reinforced with their entire lives. Die for the czar, die for True. the czar. <laughs> you know, uh, True. glory to the empire. But also, also Putin uses uh, this war as an opportunity to get rid of, and this is once again another illustration that he repeats after Hitler, get rid of what? Uh, of nationalities that do not uh, go well with his myths of Ruskimir. You know, because lots of people sent to the trenches in Ukraine, they are not Russian and they do not feel this Russian glory, but they come from very depressive regions where money never reaches them and they also suffer from alcoholism. This is indeed a problem and it's a huge problem, especially among some nationalities that were did not have this habit and Russia used alcohol as a way to pay for work for during Soviet times. And uh, for them, when you hear their mothers being interviewed, they say like, Oh, that's a solution. Otherwise, he would have died in his, like, early sets is here, but then he will die in Ukraine as a hero. And I think this huge poverty of lots of these depressive regions is another thing that makes them go, because their life is so, like, miserable and depressive, and that's the way to get, like, a car or a flat or something like that. I think the salaries that they're making, you know, 2200 US dollars equivalent is a lot of money for rural Siberia, but it's a sugar rush. And the oligarchs of Moscow and St. Petersburg will get that money back eventually, somehow, with these rural people just paying for basic necessities. But they're throwing away the lives of their children, their future, without young people, a lot of these villages and, and cities and towns are just going to die. You know, if, if, if women can't find a husband, they're going to have to move to a bigger city to find one or move abroad, just willingly become the fourth wife of, you know, an Emirati sheik or whatever, or find love mm -hmm. with all the single dudes mm -hmm. in China because they're missing a lot of women. <laughs> yeah, China is slowly moving in that direction. What happens right now in the far east of Russia is this process if of... You're an uh, if you're an impoverished Russian woman in Siberia, uh, moving to China for a better life and marrying a Chinese guy seems like a good deal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it may be. We just have to ask what China thinks about that. <laughs> uh, I think China would take the women. They don't want the dudes, but they'll take the women.
Okay. Let's uh, mm -hmm. let's talk about General Zaluzny because I know universally he's a very respected and well liked uh, military commander. President Zelensky made the tough decision that a president sometimes has to make, changing a leadership role in the middle of a war. I just want to get your thoughts, e either your personal opinions or the opinions of other Ukrainians you know about the situation with General Zaluzny being replaced. <laughs> Well, um, you are very correct in your observations that General Zaluzhny is loved and respected all over Ukraine, and uh, perhaps he's the most respected, loved, and trusted Ukrainian at the moment, which is indeed unique, taking into account that wartime is always difficult. There are quarrels, misunderstandings, anxiety, stress that comes with that, but everyone trusts General Zaluzhny. Uh, but of course, we were. It was in the air that he might be dismissed sometime soon, and I cannot tell you that General Zaluzhny personally was against that, or he treated it as something uh, unbelievable or uh, inappropriate. Because it's also difficult to work during like two years, not to work but to serve during this two years of war, and um, we will see what happens after this change but in general it's accepted normally in uh, uh, ukraine we do understand that during war times president has a right to make this decision what is important all from what we see the relations within the command of ukrainian army between the generals between the commanders of different um, troops they are totally okay and zaluzhny is not leaving uh, the country or leaving the army me, he will remain. And General Sirsky is not someone new to the army. He was one of the closest uh, friends, I think, even. And um, uh, counterparts of General Zaluzhny in many of his operations, he was responsible for the defense of Kyiv, which is super important at the very start of war, and also some counteroffensive operation in Kharkiv region, which were successful. I am honest with all of uh, our viewers. He does not have the charisma of Zaluzhny, and that is what people widely discuss, because Zaluzhny, on every photo, on every contact with the army, uh, he managed to grab all the attention, and he is, I'd say, a typical Ukrainian, like, man, military man. That's how we see them. That's how we visualize them. Uh, Sirsky is a little bit different. He is more reserved. He's less visible, but uh, this does not make him a worse uh, leader. So we will see. From what I also understand, this is not just the change of General Zaluzhny. It is also a change of some other commanders. Uh, and uh, this one went really well because from what I see, reading Ukrainian military experts, reading famous Ukrainian military people, they are satisfied with this upgrades. Uh, so um, president remains in really good um, relations with General Zaluzhny and it is extremely important to preserve this unity and I believe that all will continue working uh, united. Of course, this is a difficult moment. Uh, both on the front lines, with the support globally, uh, with the elections, like 2024 is the election year. Two billion people will participate in different levels of uh, election worldwide. So, of course, it's really tough, uh, but I ho hope we will be able to uh, stand against this various psychological operations, because, you know, like, it's everywhere around, but in general, I'd say this decision was accepted and now we are watching, remembering that Sirsky is not new. He was already one of the most important people in the Ukrainian army. I remember uh, when Izium was liberated, he was in charge of the Harki counteroffensive. I saw a bunch of interviews and videos with him at the time, and I remember being very impressed, so he's familiar to me. But I actually saw a post on Twitter that I thought was pretty good where it said uh, Ukraine's military effort right now is being led by a Jewish man, Zelensky, a Muslim man, Umarov, and an ethnic Russian, uh, this new general. So how is that a Ukrainian Nazi regime when those are the top three figures? Yeah. So, Yeah. 
<laughs> Russian propaganda doesn't uh, you know, doesn't have to make sense. Uh, you know, as one of my subscribers beautifully commented once, uh, there are Nazis in Ukraine. These are Russian soldiers. <laughs> So that's exactly uh, what we feel because honestly, yeah, we I've seen posts like that, but in Ukraine it was never an issue. No one actually thought about like who is Zelensky by origin or who is Zirsky by origin. We do care about this patriotism, protection of uh, the land, but I think it tells a lot to those who still believe sometimes Russian propaganda, how far away it is from reality. Related to military matters, I don't understand this. I've not read enough about it, but there's been this debate, intense debate, uh, about draft le legislation concerning future mobilizations. Can you give some background information about a potential Ukrainian mobilization and what your thoughts are on it? I think that everything goes as like predicted as during all wars it happens, I mean big long wars. At the very start of Russian invasion, it was a huge like wave of patriotism and self-sacrifice when we could literally observe cues of people standing to this recruiting point. And uh, many people went to the front lines and now they are already uh, serving actively for two years. That is really difficult, uh, taking into account that sometimes they spend six months, nine months on the very on the zero line. <clears throat> there is a need for a change as we understand that this is going to be a long war. This is already a long war. And of course, uh, any like mobilization is not a simple process because what I try to remind my viewers to, the majority of people on the front lines in Ukraine are not those who chose it as their career. Uh, these are not professional military men who have been trained, whose choice that was. Many of these people are teachers, I don't know, doctors, uh, uh, builders, taxi drivers, many of them did think it will take a month or it will take half a year. And now after two years, it's really difficult for them uh, because like, they don't have contact with their family, with their life, with their health. Once again, those people who volunteered at the very beginning, they didn't even pass all the health tests, like their blood pressure, condition of their back, knees, whatever. And they have lots of like chronic illnesses and so on. And now the mobilization process starts. And of course, there are lots of people who are afraid. And that's natural because... Um, it's a big war and for example in my city like every day or every other day you will see a military funeral and of course it caused lots of troubles and anxiety but at the same time I am really satisfied that Ukraine despite war is changing quickly reforming quickly and both Sersky by the way too and Zaluzhny they were involved in the introduction of NATO standards reforms like they know a lot about that uh, trying to make <clears throat> military service even in times of war more like friendly if it's possible to say so when they take into account the um, previous background of a person or for example what is the place that you consider yourself to be most useful because at the very start of war it was like everyone to the tank or everyone in that direction and here they try to identify already who is more who is better, I don't know, drone operator and who is good at engineering and who can join IT and other things. So it's extremely important to continue this change so that people uh, will feel that they are, um, when they are in the army, they are doing the best of what they can. You know, sometimes Russian trolls, they like asking me why uh, aren't I at the front lines? Why haven't I been mobilized? They don't mobilize women in Ukraine. But when I try to visualize what if this happens and I have to go and serve, what will I do? For me, the most important thing is to be where like I can be the most useful. I mean, my some of my talents, my background knowledge that can be used. And that's what the Ukrainian army does at the moment. 
Um, then, of course, there are lots of uh, various psychological operations, including Russian psychological operations, which try to shake the society, saying, have you seen some deputies on the front lines? or uh, something like that. But I cannot say it's a huge problem at the moment. And I do see a lot of newly mobilized people among my friends. So there are many people who did not volunteer at the beginning, but when they receive this invitation, they accept it. And uh, it's extremely important for them to know that the army cares about them and will choose the best position, not like the one that just is free at the moment, <laughs> but the one that where they can be most useful. I think for people who have never served in the military, they don't they don't understand there's a distinction between combat roles and non-combat roles. There are lots of non-combat roles that need to be filled that, uh, I mean, as an American who served in the military, where I think 20 to 25 percent of our military is female, that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you're going to be on the zero line with an automatic rifle. We need we yeah. need maintainers. We need uh, communication specialists. We need people in charge of logistics and supplies. Like there's lots of support positions that can be filled by women without. Obviously, everyone's life is at risk because Russian missiles can go anywhere. But as far as uh, fighting on the front lines, uh, if women want to volunteer to do that, I, I, I think they should be allowed to. But uh, as far as mobilization and, and, and forcing people into those types of combat roles, I, I personally don't support that. But I don't think Ukraine is anywhere close to considering that. No, and it's really cool that we do have a lot of women in Ukrainian army, and this percent is growing, and many of them choose combat roles too, which is, I think, makes our uh, army more humane. I think it's important. Uh, but uh, you've mentioned it, and it's really important at this moment that uh, the country, the state starts communicating this thing, that there are lots of combat and non-combat tasks. Uh, because what Russia tries to like send the message, you will be taken to army and tomorrow you're dead. And it's really difficult sometimes to persuade in the country. But luckily, there are lots of opinion leaders. There are lots of stories that demonstrate the country. And and by the way, by the way, there are thousands of people who have found new sense and like new success even inside Ukrainian army. And they have the purpose in life and uh, they see their future differently. And I, I think that communication here is vital. Let me just share with you uh, a story from my military job uh, as a missileer. Mm -hmm. I sat underground mm -hmm. in a missile silo in charge of the maintenance, security, and operations of the Minuteman III Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System. But this was a job that only men could do until 1988. So the United States has had missileers in charge of nuclear weapons from the first silos in the 60s through 1988. And this was men only. Women were not allowed to do this job. And in 1988, they said, no, I think women can do this job. There's... there's you're just sitting at a console all day and talking on the telephone, mm -hmm. basically. And then I, I'll just give my personal opinion. Uh, I know people will dispute this, but when a woman is around, men act differently. And they kind of take better care of themselves. <laughs> like they, they, just, they just put more effort into uh, every aspect uh, if there are other women around not saying that you know they're they're interested or, or or trying to date but just the socialization of the two genders i think is actually very beneficial to the united states military when it's only dudes together it gets weird it gets kind of gross kind of grungy doesn't smell great but as soon as like women are introduced to a group men just generally behave better in my opinion so i think this helped uh, the missileer career field having women also serving downstairs in the capsules. Uh, people were always saying, well, you can't have men and women serving together. That would lead to uh, inappropriate relations. And no, we've been doing it for 30 years. It's, it's, it's manageable. You just have to, you know, use, use higher thinking powers to control yourself. 
Yeah, you're right. Uh, it's true. You know, I've graduated from a linguistic department, which is purely female department in in my case was. And uh, if uh, at least a couple of uh, boys studied together, it was a different atmosphere. And once again, it's not about dating or relationship. It's just about some different uh thoughts, behavior mechanism, and it's important. So I totally agree with you that just like this uh, added balance is important. Let's now switch to U.S. politics. Being that I'm American, I, I've been laser focused on this issue to my audience. I know there's a lot of Europeans and people living around the world who don't understand what's happening. So I'm, I'm trying to demystifying it. But I just want to get your opinions and your reaction. Uh, as the U.S. Congress for four months now has been fighting over and debating this military assistance package in its current form. It's, it's, it's valued at around 60 billion U.S. dollars, and I argue this needs to pass, but I just want to get your reactions and your thoughts as an outsider. What, what's your interpretation of the chaos in Washington, D.C.? Thank you. I always try to avoid these topics on my channel because I do understand that I'm a foreigner, I'm alien, and there are lots of things that are below the surface that I may not see and understand. So if something you will not like in my answer, I do not intend uh, to offend anyone. And it's just because I, it's not like my country, not my deputies, and I uh, understand that. But of course, we observe it all very attentively. And what is worse, Russia also observes it very attentively and uh, partially uses it as an argument inside the psychological fights against attacks against Ukraine, saying like, you see, um, you're losing the support of the world, you're losing the support of the United States, everyone is tired. I do understand that people support us. I mean, like, I always divide, like, citizens from uh, the presidents, prime ministers, because there is typically a huge difference even in the modes. I think in Ukraine, we do believe it's really bad that 2024 is the election year because elections always bring a lot of quarrels, uh, hysteria sometimes, and it's difficult to observe when lots of your uh, country's lives depend on that. <clears throat> uh, I don't want to think that the U.S., any party wants to abandon Ukraine, but sometimes it does look like that. Uh, what is also worse, I do have people telling me, don't worry, it's just a couple of months after it all finishes, it will be different. But these months, they all cost human lives. And uh, from what I understand, there are already shortages of uh, supplies on the Ukrainian front lines. And Russians also know about that. They really well know about that. And they have partners, extremely toxic partners like North Korea or like Iran, or like China, that continuously supply them. And Russia is a much bigger country with a stronger military industry that was getting ready for this war, and even it needs support. So it goes without saying that Ukraine also needs it, but it all takes really long, and we don't know if we will get uh, that support in the end. <clears throat> so uh, first of all, it... Oh, I'm, we were talking about this great change that air defense systems brought to Ukraine. They can also disappear if this uh, support disappears. Ukraine does not have a strong military infrastructure, I mean factories and plants. First of all, because we were living our peacefully life, did not plan to invade anyone. And also because after the USSR collapsed, we were heavily demilitarized by a lot of countries. Many countries encouraged Ukraine to give up its weapons, and many of these weapons actually traveled back to Russia because somehow the world made a mistake and saw Russia as a guarantee of peace and security in the region when it is just the country and now it targets us with the missiles that it took away from Ukraine. Uh, we cannot, some say, well, build the factories and so on. Our country is in active war. Lots of our territories, infrastructure and military objects are destroyed. This does not happen at the moment in Russia, so they can maintain lots of their infrastructure 
most of which they inherited from the USSR. In Ukraine, it's different, and it's really difficult to build something huge when you still have to protect the front lines and even when your schools get destroyed. So we greatly rely on the support of our allies. And uh, what is also very discussed here in Ukraine, how at the beginning of invasion, the um, top representatives of the United States travel to the European Union to persuade uh, European leaders to support Ukraine. <laughs> and now we see the contrary procedure when EU leaders travel to the United States to persuade to continue this support. Uh, it goes without saying that I'm subjective here. It's about the survival of my people, of my country. It's about uh, the existence of Ukraine, because if Russia is not stopped, it will continue moving. But if we try to look at it objectively, and if well, Ukraine falls, for example, this is a signal to many other authoritarian regimes that you can go on and nothing will actually stop you. Russia is prepared for a long, exhausting war. Uh, it's good for its economy. It cannot compete with other countries in science, in innovation. It can only get what it wants through war, threats, and that's what it plans to do. And uh, also by supporting us, uh, I think it's an investment in future peace and uh, security, uh, just as it was in 1939. Uh, and of course, it will not end in Ukraine if Ukraine uh, does not manage to stop it. It goes without saying. It may seem, you know, like, mm, I will not comment on this ideas to provoke Russia, attack one of NATO countries, which is always bad and it's a tragedy for if any war starts anywhere in the world. Uh, but um, I do believe that in 10 years or more, if Ukraine falls, Russia can try and attack a NATO country. It will not happen today when it's weak, when it cannot succeed in Ukraine, but in 10, 15 years, and that's not long. That's the time that we can still see. And that's why um, we hope that somehow uh, the United States will remain the strong country, one of these leaders, uh, global leaders, because that's real. And by supporting Ukraine, uh, it will continue supporting democracy and freedom all over the world. Because uh, who told us that the future of this planet is democracy? It has to be protected because authoritarian regimes at the moment unite really quickly and to some extent very effectively. The tragedy happening uh, in American politics is that a supermajority of our government, of course, supports Ukraine. President Biden, uh, defense leaders of the Pentagon. We just had a procedural vote on advancing this bill in the Senate, and it got 67 votes. That's a supermajority. That's two-thirds. If Speaker Johnson in the House just allowed a vote, scheduled a vote, it would get a supermajority. It would get two-thirds. But it's a minority, and, and in a democracy, you, you have to have checks and balances. You have to have minority protections. The founders deliberately designed everything to move slow to prevent authoritarianism. And it's just incredibly disheartening that a minority, uh, the House MAGA Republicans, are, are abusing this minority protection to enable authoritarianism, to help the Russians. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that the political process, as long as people who support Ukraine are relentless and we keep fighting and we keep applying pressure, uh, the pressure will build until the dam breaks and Speaker Johnson hopefully is removed. And uh, obviously, I believe Ukraine needs to get this uh, military aid this year. So my follow up question uh, for ordinary people watching this at home, what advice can you give them? Uh, as far as their ability to help Ukraine from wherever they are in the world. Thank you. And first of all, I would like to stress that we do feel the support of people, of people who uh, work with Ukrainian refugees, of people who uh, participate in various charities and volunteering initiatives, of people who watch, want to know the truth, want to understand um, 
the dangers that Russia imposed. And Jake, as you beautifully described, the tragedy of this uh, Russian, um, like, I don't know how to call it, technique that they use. They use democracy to shake democracy. Like they, they use our democratic mechanisms that are developed for the good to actually destroy their democracies. And um, we have to be aware that the world has changed. I know many want to return back to old normal, like 2019 or pre-COVID times or something like that. But unfortunately, it's impossible and we have to accept this new reality. And this new reality is not that we enjoy our freedom and democracies, but we fight for them. Some as Ukrainians, because of unfortunate neighborhood, decades of history and our own mistakes, have to fight with blood. Others have to fight emotionally with taxes, I don't know, with attention. And, uh, well, my, how can people help? Well, first of all, don't get tired, uh, because like <laughs> we're not, um, believe me, I don't want to tell you that we are in a worse situation, but we are indeed in a worse situation. And just a war ago, for me, many things were also like problematic, higher prices on something, or I don't know, the need to work extra hours. It seemed like a huge trouble, but when literally your cities are erased or in the news you read about children that burned to death because of Russian missile attack, you realize, oh, that was not a problem. And that's why it's extremely important to remain aware, not to forget about the things, not to think about Ukrainian victims as statistics. Of course, if it's possible to demonstrate your politicians, to demonstrate your opinion leaders that you do want Ukraine to be supported because that's where we fight for the future of democracy, for the future of the world. <clears throat> and it's very actually important, like in conversations everywhere, not to forget about that. I know many feel uncomfortable when they learn about these tragedies, but that's the reality. It's just like dealing with a disease and now Russia is a disease. Sometimes you don't want to learn about this new regime that you have to follow, dangers that this disease imposes on your body. But the only way to cure yourself is actually accept this reality and start doing what the doctor says, be it bitter, sour or painful sometimes. And we are in this situation, I mean, with the world uh, globally. And um, so first of all, don't get tired. Uh, if to speak about uh, various charities, people do support that. At the same time, we do feel the lower support. I always stand for military support, not just like humanitarian, because after this two years of invasion, Ukrainians inside Ukraine are not that bad at organizing, I don't know, kitchens, uh, places to live, clothes and other stuff. It's not the priority. The priority is to stop this war by uh, stopping Russia and punishing them. So we do need like, this military backup. That's what's important. Before we started filming, we talked about a question you wanted to ask me. Do you want to also pose it to the audience for me to answer? Uh, yes, <laughs> I think. And I will also read the comments below our video. So uh, I encourage like the people who watch us also to answer this question. Uh, with, when you are an important person or an important country, uh, you always have more responsibilities, more attention on you. On you. And I think that for a hundred years, at least after the First World War, uh, the United States of America are a great country. And lots of countries learn from you. Uh, lots of countries need your support and like attention. Uh, I know it may be difficult and uh, now partially it's a Russian tactics to cause chaos inside different countries, their societies to distract their attention from their idea to take over the world together with other authoritarian regimes. And there are lots of ideas now that we read on the media that the United States should quit of this role, too many responsibilities, concentrate on your own internal politics, don't uh, you play big. Uh, 
how do you feel inside the American society? Are people ready to become this, like, to lose this American superpower and to become, like, ordinary country? And uh, do they understand that if this chance is lost, I mean, like, if they give up, uh, it will be very difficult to return back? And I'm so much afraid that this place will immediately be occupied by evil regimes that are not so sensitive, tolerant and democratic to the problems that we want to solve. Once again, returning to this technique of authoritarian regimes to use democracy to destroy democracy. So I'll, I'll start my answer with a statistic. Uh, at the end of World War II, uh, the United States was half of the global economy. Because all the European powers had destroyed themselves, because the United States had destroyed Japan, the rest of the world was undeveloped, unindustrialized. Half of the global economy was the U.S. economy. Uh, so the United States, because of our isolation in geography, we just have the best geography in the world. We have the best agriculture, the best coastlines. Our only two neighbors are Canada and Mexico, and we have good relations with them. So the United States just inherited the best poker hand in the world. Like, we cannot lose. Uh, and, and we rode that for a good long time, but the other great powers of the world reindustrialized. They, they rebuilt their economies. The developing world developed. And when you look at what percent of the, of the global economy is America today, and it's closer to like 25% and falling. And so we have to accept a smaller role in the world, simply from an economic standpoint. There's nothing wrong with that. But as far as being a global hegemon, does the United States want to do this anymore? And this has been a role we've been falling out of since the Soviet Union collapsed. It was very easy. I, I recently rewatched this speech from Ronald Reagan in 1983 talking about Captive Nations Week. He was meeting with Baltic Americans, saying that the United States, this is 1983, the United States does not accept Soviet dominion over the Baltics, over Ukraine, over Poland, and, and the Iron Curtain. It was easy to unite Americans when the Soviet empire was communist, so that was anti-capitalist, uh, you know, anti and it was, it was atheist. The fact that Stalin destroyed all these churches and tried to snuff out Christianity. So America is a very religious country, and it was easy. It was easy to, to unite everyone on foreign policy when the Russians made it so easy during the Cold War. But it's, it's changed. The calculus has changed. I, and I think this is a deliberate rebranding from the Russians. We got the Eastern Orthodox Church now doesn't matter if the patriarch is a former KGB agent and the state controls mm -hmm. the church. The fact that they go through the motions and they've got the videos and they can show this to Christians in America, this is a dampening effect to get rid of outrage or hatred towards the Russians that we felt during the Cold War. Next, uh, Russia doesn't identify as communist anymore. Are they really that good of, uh, at capitalism? No but they say they're capitalists. So as far as the economic insecurity of wealthy people in America or Wall Street or American companies, they don't feel it anymore, whereas this existed under communism. So it's just harder. It's harder to unite Americans. There's over 330 million of us uh, on foreign policy issues. And you're right, Russia's done a really good job of sneaking in this messaging of, why are you getting involved in Europe? Why are you getting involved in Asia? This is not your backyard. This is not your responsibility. So there's a very legitimate political movement in America to say, F the old world. Let's just focus on North and South America. This is our, it's called the Monroe Document, the Monroe do Doctrine mm -hmm. in U.S. history, where as long as the rest of the world doesn't mess with North and South America, we won't mess with them. And it, it's hard to refute that. Uh, as far as on my channel, trying to make political arguments, I, I get these comments, I read them. How do I counter that? I, I, I can attempt all day saying that 
or a global interconnected economy. And if Russia and China are just allowed to start gobbling up their neighbors, this will negatively impact the stock markets and your own financial incentives. As far as making the humanitarian case, this has always been the political debate between realism and old school liberalism, also called idealism. Realists believe that we don't have uh, we don't have interests that are global. All interests are personal or are national. Whereas liberals or idealists will say, no, human rights should be protected. If one person is being abused, this is an assault on humanity and we should stand up for all people. We should promote democracy and, and human rights around the world because that's the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people. But I actually think those people are a minority. Most people are just hardcore realists acting in their own self-interest. And it's just harder to unite Americans to get involved in issues happening around the globe. I don't know if that was the answer you were looking for, but that's that's what I honestly see as what's going on in American politics today, what, what Trumpism really is. Trump is an isolationist. He doesn't care if Putin massacres Ukrainians or if China invades Taiwan, uh, an island of 20 million people. Uh, th but no, there's no positive scenario where nuclear powers start gobbling up their, their smaller neighbors where this benefits America. Yeah, but um, I don't know, maybe it's war in Ukraine that makes me feel that everything is indeed very interconnected and uh, it is never limited just to your continent. It seems like that, but they always have consequences that will be felt even financially, if not like morally, uh, idealistically. If, for example, Ukraine falls, Russia expands, unites with China and North Korea and other things. And I'm not talking about 2025. I'm talking about like 2060 or something. But I do understand people don't think in this <laughs> numbers. I, I, I think China knows that at some point in the next century, they're going to go to war with Russia and, and take their stuff. Uh, you get these satellite images in the desert of Western China. They're, they're building nuclear silos like crazy. And why does China need nuclear silos? If Russia has nuclear silos and they're such good, you know, military allies. Uh, and and I, I look at those satellite images and I'm like, those, that's not to deter the United States. That's to deter Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and China, given the size of their population... If they lose a couple cities, if they lose 20, 30, 100 million people, they don't care. If, if they can expand, get outer Manchuria back and, and, and the resources of Siberia, I, I think they would go for it. It's, Mao said, nuclear war is not a problem. We've got enough people to outlast any other country. Um, I remember like when I was at school, perhaps there was a joke. Uh, how can you like destroy Russia, that Ukraine has to proclaim war with China and with all Chinese troops moving through <laughs> Russia. When they reach Ukraine, we can give up, <laughs> but there will be no Russia anymore. <laughs> you know, like it's a silly joke, but yeah. It's cra crazy enough to um, work in 2024. <laughs> yeah, it may be, but yeah. Uh, okay, Anna, I'm going to give you the final word for the audience. Uh, what closing thoughts would you like to give them? Oh, thank you so much for speaking about Ukraine. Um, I will be honest with you. I am worried. Uh, when this war started, uh, we all believed it will last uh, like a month or two or half a year. And um, we were and we are very united. But this fatigue, uh, these doubts, they are real for every person. But at the same time, witnessed what we have and what we do daily, we understand such kind of evil indeed has to be stopped. For us, it's very personal at the moment. And I do understand what you said, Jake, that it's always personal, uh, be it politics, be it the economy. But somehow at the very sp before the invasion, I did not believe it possible. I thought it's irrational, it's illogical, but it turned out to be real because Russia is irrational and illogical. That's why um, even when it seems it will never reach you, 
it may be a mistake because that's how we lived and it turned out to be different. And I think that by investing in Ukraine, we are not asking other people to come and fight instead of us. We are ready to do that, but we do need this backup uh, starting from the demilitarization processes in which we so actively participated, like with the past memorandum. I do understand, like, it was also in our interest. But anyway, uh, maybe it was a good thing, but not in this world where the reality is totally different. And uh, now it's not about Ukraine asking just for Ukraine. It's also the investment in Peace and security, because every, I don't know if people watch this interview of Putin and uh, Tucker Carlson, which turned out into two and a half hour um, lecture on history, but what will stop other countries from reviewing any borders or following any fantasies that uh, they can evolve in their heads, especially if these are authoritarian countries that do not respect human life. And uh, I do feel worried when I think about this future. I've always believed that every country, every society wants to evolve and to become democratic. Different kinds of democracies, national peculiarities, but still that this freedom, choice, respect is central for every human uh, culture. But it turns out that it may be different and that these uh, regimes that disrespect human life, that command, that have authoritarian leaders, they turn out to be very effective. And then it may cause danger to the global well-being. And I do understand that we are not like purely idealists, but at the same time, human life has to be valuable and important. And Ukraine stands for this and stands not just for... Uh, we. I think that what happens right now in Ukraine is an illustration of uh, the future that we have to work hard to protect the things that we took for granted. And please don't get tired because we are in a much worse situation sometimes but we are not. So I hope you will stay with us and uh, we will see Putin in The Hague, just as Hitler seemed invincible in 1940, but in 1945, it was different. Well, for anyone who made it this far in the podcast, they're probably the same as me. I'm not tired. I'm not giving up. I'm going to continue supporting Ukraine for as long as it takes. Russia will be defeated and Ukraine finally will find peace and security. Thank you so much for your time today, Anna. Uh, I wish you the best. Thank you. I'm sure we'll talk again someday. Uh, until the next one, everyone. Thank you so much. Take care.